Wow. All right. That was impressive. Yeah. I was prepared for that. Uh, all right. Uh, welcome, everyone. We've got a very, very nice uh, group of participants here. Uh, welcome to Cyber Sensei. You're on Cyber Sensei. That's the right podcast. If you're not uh, for this podcast, then, uh, then you're not in the right place. Uh, Cyber Sensei is a definitive podcast for cybersecurity educators. It's brought to you by Cyberbit. My name is Sharon Rosenman. I'm the CMO at Cyberbit, and I'm joined by Mr. Adam Bricker, a widely recognized cyber education expert and founder of the Carolina Cyber Center. Hi, Adam. Good afternoon. I don't know about how widely recognized, but I'm uh, sure glad to be here. <laughs> recognized. Let's let's settle for recognized. But uh, no, but uh, you're being modest. So Adam is a very, very experienced uh, uh, cyber education expert. We're going to hear from Adam a lot today. Um, very, very excited to see uh, you here and the rest of the participants. Uh, it's our first episode of Cyber Sensei. I'm a bit excited. I don't know about you. Uh, and yeah. but it's it's lovely to see that we already have a, a really nice attendance. Uh, I see a lot of familiar and unfamiliar names in the audience. Great to have all of you here. Um, this is the first episode. So first of all, what is Cyber Sensei? Who is it for? Uh, why did we start it? Um, we created Cyber Sensei for cybersecurity educators uh, so they can be better and more successful. Uh, in their jobs, uh, Cyberbit, as a cyber range provider for universities and colleges, has been working with uh, educators in colleges and universities all over the world uh, for many years. At some point, we realized that um, this community is missing uh, a community, a place where, where they can learn from experts, from colleagues about new methodologies, new programs that have been successful for others, new tools that might help them. Uh, so every week, we're going to be joined by a different cyber sensei, an expert in a topic related to cyber security education. Uh, in some of the episodes, we'll be joined by industry leaders who are going to help us understand who are the ideal graduates that they need, what do they need colleges and universities to uh, produce. Um, and hopefully, we'll be getting some requests from you on, on hosts and topics that you will want us to talk about, and we'll obviously uh, create new episodes about that. Um, just a bit housekeeping. Um, it's live, obviously. We're we're in a live recording. We're in a live broadcast. Uh, microphones are currently muted. We will be unmuting uh, your microphones uh, after about uh, 15 to 20 minutes uh, of discussion between Adam and myself. Uh, what we'd like you to do, if you'd like to ask questions, and we're going to leave plenty of time for questions, if you want to ask a question live directed to, to Adam or, or to me, uh, just raise your hand uh, in the raise hand on the raise hand button uh, in Zoom, uh, or you can just send us questions via chat in the Q and A uh, section of the chat. We'll be addressing your questions during the the Q and A session. Um, if you're if you need to drop early and you're concerned of missing some of this uh, broadcast, we are going to uh, record it. We are recording it and we're going to uh, make it available for streaming on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts on the Cyberbit YouTube page. And uh, some of it will also be broadcast on the Cyberbit LinkedIn profile. So you're welcome to follow us on LinkedIn uh, uh, to, learn, to hear uh, the recording and also for future uh, episodes that we'll be running. Um, and uh, for today's uh, episode, today's theme is quite big. Uh, we called it the unspoken skill gap in the cybersecurity market. We're going to be touching upon a topic that we'll be probably speaking about throughout the entire year in different episodes. And this is the gap uh, between cybersecurity graduates and what are the organizations, the corporates uh, expecting uh, from the graduates that uh, educators are producing and what we can do uh, to close this gap. Um, so let's dive right in. So. Uh, Adam, um, I know you for a few years as the founder of the Carolina Cyber Center, but can you tell us and tell the audience a bit more about your background, your very long and impressive career in cybersecurity, and just introduce yourself in just a minute. Well, thank you. Yeah, I feel like I've just been enormously blessed and fortunate to have had a career. It started off as an applied aerospace engineer and then applied physicist to mathematician working we joke on, you know, and it's true, it was weapons of mass destruction. And after about 10 years of that, uh, got on the career location or career um, 
the executive ladder at Lockheed and got a lot of training there as an executive. But when I went in to run the IT department uh, for software development at Southwest Airlines, we were one of the first organizations that moved our ticketing to the cloud. And we started to understand just how complex that was, especially at the time back in the 90s. And in the aughts, I then took over the uh, software development and uh, security for Yum, the big Pizza Hut Taco Bell restaurant company. But it wasn't until I moved into the humanitarian aid space, working as the head of IT and security for World Vision, where we were trying to secure systems all over the world. This was about uh, 17, 18 years ago. And I realized how difficult it is in a lot of these contexts, how much the human dimensions have changed weighs in on it. I then went on to do, uh, so I was the chief uh, informatics officer for a healthcare startup focused on oncology and looking for better ways to treat cancer, an ed tech startup in Latin America. And then a few years ago, as you mentioned, I was really fortunate with Dr. Paul Maurer here at Montreal College to co-found the Carolina Cyber Center. And then with uh, with him and uh, Dr. Mark Sorrells to co-found the Carolina Cyber Network, which we hope we get a chance to talk about. But yeah, really blessed here. So first of all, so you basically made the move, you spent time in both sides, on the cybersecurity side and the corporate side, even on the government kind of federal side, you mentioned a couple of those companies. And on the education side. So I think one of the nice things, and maybe that's something the audience will want to ask you later, is kind of the view from the from the client side and from the uh, university side so that's producing the graduate. So you have both angles, which is great uh, as an educator. Uh, and you said that you founded the Carolina Cyber Center and then went ahead to found the Carolina Cyber Network. So can you explain this path a little bit? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bizarre story where I had finished up as the CIO and head of security at a mining company about four, three, four years ago now, and, and through a mutual friend had an opportunity to come, as I call it, like a supreme act of brain damage. It's like, who wants to move to Western North Carolina to a small Christian college and start a cybersecurity center for training and services in a what I call a cyber naked area, Western North Carolina? But I just thought this was the, the thrill and opportunity of a lifetime to come uh, raise money, become an educator. I mean, I've been I've been teaching at the higher education market for about a decade. I've taught, I teach at the Col de Pons in Paris, and I teach at a number of other universities and schools here in, in the U.S. But to co-found a center and get a chance to build it from the ground up. And as the, the famous thing from Half says, you know, when one teaches to learn, and I hate to tell my students, I think I always learned more from them than they did me. But that was the Carolina Cyber Center. And then we had an opportunity here with uh, some of the three-letter agencies, but also the extraordinary men and women who, who lead the state of North Carolina to raise some money to bound and bind together in a shared agenda, about a dozen universities, mostly community colleges here in North Carolina, to lift the boats, all boats floating together about how can we take education to another level, uh, especially in, in cybersecurity. So it was, a, it was an awesome journey. Yeah. So um, that's first a very very impressive uh, career and the, and and the journey itself and uh, to connect to our topic today. Uh, so you've been in the industry for a while and and you have a perspective across quite a few years. And uh, when we're talking about a cyber skill gap and in context of education, because there's skill gaps all over the place in cybersecurity, but in context of education, what would you define as the main skill gap? I think there are three critical skill gaps, one of which is, especially for the entry-level talent coming out of schools, is the actual capability with the hands-on skills to do the work and to, to be known to do the work. Um, the second skill gap is in what we refer to as the essential life skills. How do they think about this uh, career? How do they think about being a cybersecurity professional? How do they collaborate with other people? Where is their curiosity and their critical thinking skills and thinking like the adversary? I think that's the second one, this human dimensions of being a cybersecurity professional. But the third one is, how do you tell your story? How do you get a job in this field? We, I would meet a number of young men and women who got cert happy and they had a lot of certifications on their resumes, but couldn't actually do the work. And I've at the other end met people that were transitioning into this career who actually had some really good hands-on skills, but actually didn't know how to tell their story to get a job. So I think and it's all that, three. And that's something that you believe, uh, that's the third one is actually quite in, intriguing to me. And that's something you think educators can help uh, students to be better at. So how to tell the story and get a job. Is that something that you feel we can teach? That's right. I, in uh 
I've been blessed now to teach probably 250 students, 300 students in cybersecurity over the last three years. And the number of times they get halfway through the program and I say, do you, when you go to an interview, do you, do you know how this is really going to happen? Do you know what they're really looking for when they talk to you? They're not going to tell you. They're not going to be overt and tell you, but they're actually looking to say, are you curious? And how well do you think and solve problems? And then this, this feeling they get, do I see you as part of my tribe? And if you're not in, of, and for this community and reading and learning and getting the practical hands-on experience in these environments, which is you know what we'll get a chance to talk about today, yeah. sometimes they just don't see you as part of the tribe. And are you memorable? Is there something about you I remember after I've interviewed 20 different candidates? Yeah, I think we, we talked when we prepared for, for this conversation, we, we talked about being part of the tribe is, I guess, experiencing kind of what the the uh recruiters or the your, your future employer ha- is experiencing to understand what does it mean even to be in an incident and and that's that's one of the skill apps is basically understanding the experience that you'll be um uh, exposed to in your in your future career and we'll talk a little bit about how you solve that in your uh in the institutions and uh, and the centers that you founded uh but uh getting back to your uh perspective across quite a few years in cybersecurity um, and you must have seen the changes uh, throughout the year. And uh, if we look at the cybersecurity expert of, say, five or 10 years ago, so uh, universities had to prepare a certain type of cyber IT security expert. And if you compare that to today, uh, what is the difference? What has changed in the profile of that graduates? What are the corporates looking for? What were they looking for? Uh, let's say 10 years ago, and what's changed over the last uh, 10 years? Yeah, I, I can certainly speak to my you know, endeavor. 10 years ago, I'm the CIO of a Fortune 500 company, and I'm um, looking at hiring staff. And I'm like, for cybersecurity, I'm like, I would only hire experienced people. But my lens was, I'm going to hire some experienced web developers who know how to handle the security there, experienced network engineers who know how to handle the security there, people who understand the behavioral side for phishing and business email compromise attacks. But I'm looking for very senior people who typically went from IT into cybersecurity. And then probably starting about five years ago, I started to realize there's a mindset that's actually quite different for the successful cybersecurity people that I worked with, as opposed to those who came up like I did. I was a software developer for 20 years, and that's that's how I came up the ranks in consulting and project management. And the mindset of a cybersecurity professional was quite different. And now I'm I'm teaching and helping some community colleges where they're I'm looking for some that come out of there who actually have hands on skills mm. in a number of cases, actually know the products and tools we might use. Most community colleges in four years are not giving the students the opportunity to do that. But now I'm looking for, and, and I will say, I hear a lot of hiring managers go, hey, I, I hire on attitude and train on skill. And I'm like, I never had that luxury. I needed to hire people with the attitude who actually came in with some technical skills to do the job. But to, to be fair, I think I also got better about how to assess talent and how to assess the caliber of talent I was trying to hire and put them through a different kind of, well, gauntlet before they would they would get the job. But it went from, hey, hiring experienced people to now there are people that I can assess with actual hands-on skills coming out of these schools. And I've learned that you can get some extraordinary value out of the entry-level talent. But do you think that when you say hands-on skills, isn't, isn't that something that you needed 10 years ago? I mean, you need hands-on skills today Absolutely. and you need that before, but but has anything changed in how you would, how you would uh, perform as a cyber professional uh, today, in terms of in terms yeah, of yeah, so the example is the the ten years ago, the network engineers, the software developers, the web developers, they would go through a checklist, they would go through a mindset associated. Right. If I do this, the system is secure. And again, I, I learned a lot along the way as well. But ten years ago, it was almost always about defense. Here's what I will do to keep the bad guy out, and I'm going to follow a script and a protocol. And then we said, but can you think like the attacker? Do you know how to think like they do? And, and are you hunting and staying insatiably curious about all the different vulnerabilities and exploits that are out there, all the different methods and tools that are out there? And you realize just how really complicated this is. And I started to learn, I'm looking for people who can think like an attacker, who have really exceptional problem solving and critical thinking skills, but they are a part of this tribe called cybersecurity because they are doing it. They're actually building mm-hmm. networks. They're actually setting up their honeypots. They're actually setting up their own home SIMSOC uh, SOAR tools. Um, and that's when I started to realize there's a whole nother level of 
talent out there that can be developed and that I should be hiring yeah. for. I think that's those are two points that you've mentioned. We're hearing a lot from 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 corporates that we're working with, working with you know financial institutions, insurance companies, etc., and with the universities as well. And um, what we're hearing, you said two things. One is you have to keep constantly up to date, and I think the needs to be constantly up to date ten years ago was not nearly as critical as it is today with the number of new malware and new new threats that are being released to the wild uh, every day you you can't you know you have to stay continuously updated and much more updated and you've mentioned also the curiosity critical thinking dealing with ambiguity and and that's also something that we're hearing a lot so 10 years ago or maybe a little more it would be more like the cyber professional would be like an advanced networking person or an advanced IT a professional with some additional knowledge in cybersecurity, and you would do configurations and follow protocols and perhaps close IPs in the firewall. Uh, so it's, it's a very technical profession. And the change in, in the need for critical thinking and basically being a first responder today, which is really what they need to do when they get on the job, that's been a dramatic change. So you're like, you've been like an advanced networking person and now you're a fully functional first responder that needs to work under pressure, work as a team. So this whole set of soft skills is something that many haven't realized, even the organizations themselves and probably many of the educators who are preparing those and those graduates are still dealing, I would say, with the with uh, the graduate or the cyber professional of ten years ago, which is a very technical uh, oriented person. But there's a lot more to that uh, uh, yeah. today. So that that's that's a great point. So uh, you, you've mentioned those gaps. So how can educators that are here in the room know that what they are teaching is relevant or not, or if not, how do they build that, that correct curriculum? And it's at this point that I kind of pause and I think about that great quote from F. Scott Fitzgerald, where he says, true test of intelligence is being able to hold two seemingly opposing ideas in your head at the same time and still be able to function. So as educators, what are those two seemingly opposing ideas? One of which is, if you're not doing the basics right, you haven't earned the right to go on all the sex and sizzle to the next level. If you don't know how to reduce your attack surface, you don't know the importance of asset management, you don't know the devices connected to your network, you're not keeping systems patched, you're not, those are the basics, that's the ante to play in this game. And that's still how the vast majority of the nefarious actors get into your systems. And, and, and of course, in the end, the end user, the, the weakest link. Mm -hmm. But when educators have a chance today to ask themselves, okay, where would I go for leading practices? How would I know that I'm teaching what needs to be learned and what's the most effective and efficient way for the student to learn it? And I say it that way because I think one of the mindsets that we hope to address with this podcast is that the educator, they're a broker to the student's learning journey. They are not the owner of it. And there's a big difference between pedagogy and andragogy, and they need to understand that. But where do they go to get that? And I love the Clark site, lots of great leading practices and great materials there, but you have to kind of troll through it. And then you don't know it's there, so you assume somebody's curated it, but you actually don't know if that's a leading practice you can apply to your curriculum. So the first question, what is worth what is worth knowing? And I'll be not philosophical, but in cybersecurity, what's worth knowing? Well, where are you getting that question answered and from whom? And my, my suggestion is there's lots of wonderful materials out there with the, the NIST NICE framework. But the actual hands-on practitioners in your geography that are hiring people, that's who you want to be speaking with. And you want to, you yourself want to be listening to the different podcasts and reading voraciously about what's worth knowing today after you've gotten the basics, after the students have understood the basics. And what I've seen a lot of schools make a mistake, in my humble opinion, or maybe not so humble opinion, is that they have on their board the three letter titles they think are the sexy and sizzle. They have the CIO, the CMO, the CTO, the whatever. I'm like, they don't actually do this work anymore. You want the people that actually do the work that could tell you what they're looking for from entry level hires. So, and then you find choosing, out there's choosing your advisor, the right advisors basically is a key. Get the right advisors. Yeah. And right. look at the job descriptions that they're hired that, that are out there, but you have to recognize, and this is what. I can understand why a lot of community college and four-year uh, you know, professors don't. But when you look at the job descriptions, you see what Indeed, Dice, Monster are out there. We recognize a lot of those were written to empower the applicant tracking system. 
So it's easy to look for certifications. It's easy to look for acronyms for those tracking systems to, to call resumes based on that. How do you get beyond that? How do you teach your student to hack the job? Which is the third thing we talked about earlier. How do they hack the job and present themselves? That's actually a skill because if you're curious enough to know how to hack the mindset of the person that's gonna be hiring you, you're now starting to think like a cybersecurity professional. And there's no substitute for time on task. Like training up an NFL coach or NFL quarterback or college quarterback, they look at film over and over. They're in a simulated environment over and over again. You can learn these skills, which is why they're skills and not just knowledge. So that was great. I, I just want to remind, I see that I have a lot of new joiners since we started. So uh, if any of you didn't listen to the intro, then uh, you're welcome to type in questions in the Q&A section. If you're hearing something here that you want to you want us to respond to later, we're going to open up your microphones in just a few minutes with just a couple more questions, and then we'll open up for, for your questions. Uh, if you want to ask anything live, just uh, click on raise hand. You can do that later on, and we will uh, open your micro, unmute your microphone and uh, allow you to uh, ask the questions live. So for those new joiners, uh, you're more than welcome to put in your questions or uh, just uh, ask them live in just a moment. And back to you, Adam. Here's an interesting question that we'll probably be asking every sensei uh, in, in, the, uh, in the following episodes this year. If you were to look at one myth that uh, you wish was busted for educators, what would be that, that uh, myth? Hmm. It is hard to stay at one myth because when I was launching the Carolina Cyber Center, the first thing I had to do is go figure out what's worth knowing. What, what could we do? Is Because ours our center was mainly focused on a boot camps to jumpstart people pivoting into this career or accelerating their chance. So it was a full-time nine-month or so year-long academy to get into cybersecurity. And I was trying to figure out what's worth knowing. So there were so many, so many mistakes that I made. The program now, three plus years later, is different than when we started with. You know, I'm just the only paradigm we should always carry is that there is a better way. But if I had to come down to just one, it would be that when I met a lot of community college cybersecurity instructors, very, very few of them were ever actually in the cybersecurity field. Hmm. I'd say maybe one in 30, a very small minority. But the myth is you don't actually have to be a cybersecurity expert to make a huge dent in developing the capability of some, some man or woman to become a professional in cybersecurity, not just a job, but a career. You yourself don't have to be the expert. There's so many resources and platforms at your disposal. You just got to go look for them. And that's what we hope to do in this podcast is expose you to those, to do the heavy lifting for you so you can come here and find them. No, that's great. By, by the way, when you said that you uh, you evolved the program dramatically over three years, how did you do that? What, what were the change, the, like the changes that you implemented? You said it has changed significantly. Oh, I, I almost wish you hadn't asked because it's embarrassing. You know, when I when I started three years ago, I'm like, oh, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years. I'm a smart person. I got a really good staff. We're going to custom build this program from the ground up and do what I really think we need. And I'm like. That is really, really hard to do. And then how do you align that to the frameworks and the certifications that a lot of the hiring companies are managed for? And I'm like, my goal is to get somebody a job and, and then a career in cybersecurity. They have to get to the interview, get the job, and then have a career. So now I found myself, frankly, compromising on my own initial standards, which was a lot of companies are still hiring based on certifications. But really, they're not hiring for that. That's just what gets you to the job interview. So my program then evolved to help the students get some of the core sort of, and you know, the standard ones, Net Plus, Sec Plus, et cetera, CYSP, the initial standard certifications. And then we said, but we are not going to stand for that being alone. Most of those certifications are frankly based knowledge or they're like the click next lab that you see. And, and I love these platforms. I used them as well. The NDG immersive labs, there, there are a lot of them are just click next labs. And we said, you know, what's going to set our students apart is a, is a really immersive uh, platform. And we leveraged Cyberbit and a couple of others, but we leveraged it a lot to really give them time on task. And there is no substitute for time on task. So we wanted to create an environment where the students would, would love to learn. And, you know, you asked me earlier, what was one of the myths that we busted? I realized a lot of students coming into my programs didn't know how to learn. So we had to start there, teaching them again how to learn the importance of sleep and stuff. 
but getting in a in a in a hyper simul hyper realistic simulated environment was super important. And then this third element we talked about earlier, we needed to help them become men, men, men and women of character in a field that is quite emotionally, physically, psychologically draining. It can be demanding, but there's tremendous joy in that journey of overcoming. Mm-hmm. So the program really evolved immersively, and I would say we actually spend as much time on what to know as we do the capacity to actually do the job, the hands-on capabilities, and this third one of becoming a, a person of character with these essential life skills. So if I summarize the topic, which is the skills gap, and okay, if there is a one or two main tips to educators that uh, to help them maybe align a little bit better, and, and of course, we'll be talking about different topics throughout the upcoming episode, and we're going to dive much deeper into different uh, areas, but uh how what are the the main two tips for how to be more aligned how to solve this skill gap you mentioned simulation or hands on but if you could summarize that very concisely to to the audience what worked uh, and i'm you know get embarrassed to say it took me about a year of getting into this of really working hard again i had taught cybersecurity and it and stuff for years but when i was building my own program from the ground up as opposed to teaching somebody else's it took me a while to humble myself and just say, listen, there are really smart men and women who have done this long before me. Let me go build my tribe of hands-on, freakishly smart, but also would give me the gift of time. And I, I, this field, more than any other profession I've been in, is gives back to each other. Like you're, you know, you're affording us the opportunity, so but you're giving us this, this gift to give back to the community we we care so much about. And they came alongside and helped build hands-on labs and select the right platforms and challenge myself with the rubrics. So getting that tribe to help me build and then run a program. We had invited speakers almost every week come into these programs and we never had a that are never had a problem finding them. They want to give back. They just don't know mm. how to get into the conversation with the students and then frankly how to get back out again because they have a day job. But but these platforms allow them, allow you as an educator to leverage the, the gift of the people that do this for a living. And you're the honest broker between them, the student and those who do as a profession. My counsel to a lot of educators is don't forget that you're as much a teacher as you are a coach, as you are a mentor. Did you see an, an actual impact? So you, you, you took a, a unique approach in the education program. What impact did you see on the, on the graduates? I mean, in terms of demand, salaries i think you've mentioned in one of our uh, conversations uh, for those graduates that you've educated in a very unique way what sort of impact did you see i think the you know we say impact the word to me means an impact in in whatever your social sector is it's the impact is when they don't need you anymore homelessness Mm -hmm. whatever and so my goal is that these students didn't need me anymore they may have not have wanted me from day one, but they might have needed me. So there were three levels of impact, one of which was I would watch the way they carry themselves, the way they thought of themselves, the gift they wanted to give their future self, the story they were telling themselves started to change. And it's more than just saying their confidence. It literally was they could see themselves in this future role and time on task and mentoring them and talking about what it's and then giving them a hands on environment where, of course, you're overwhelmed the first time you get into these platforms. Then you go. These people aren't any smarter than I am, but they worked hard, they were disciplined, and they learned how to learn. So the first one is how they carry them. So the second one is when they actually had time on task on these platforms, you'd watch their confidence and hands-on skills build. And mm-hmm. frankly, they just blew me away. I, I have to admit, I probably underestimated just how much they could learn. But at the end of the day, the third one was we had a goal. I want you within nine months. And yes, I realize how arrogant this is to say. In nine months, I want you to graduate a, a cyber secu- our cybersecurity academy and earn at or above prevailing wages in your professional field. And then within two years, I want you to have already earned your first promotion. Mm. And wow. to do that in and nine months, you were able to do that? That's amazing. We were able, we were able to do that. We had over 80% the first promotion in, in one year from graduation. In less than a year. They would get a job making 70, 80, 90,000 a year. And by the end of the two years, in fact, I still follow up. In fact, tomorrow afternoon, I'm having a beer with one of my, that, that he actually came to work for us to help us run the academy, but he couldn't get a job in cybersecurity. And he's now well under the six figures uh, two years later. Amazing. Wow. That's, that's impact. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, 
I think yeah, I'd like to uh, give the audience an opportunity to ask uh, some questions. And uh, so we're going to opening, be opening this up for Q&A. Again, uh, I already have one hand raised. If, you, if there's others who want to ask anything live, just uh, click on raise hand on the bottom of your screen. Uh, oh, there's more. Great. So uh, we're going to do this by order. Uh, I'll ask our uh, operations team in the background to... Um, Unmute uh, Rashid, so you can go ahead and ask your question, please, and introduce yourself, maybe. Hi, Rashid, you're still muted. Can you, uh, Amit, can you unmute Rashid, please? Now, we've got some great questions that were typed in as well yeah. we can get to. Uh... Rashid, I don't know if you're able to unmute yourself, but uh, Amit, can you please uh, unmute? All right, we're going to go to, uh, we're going to start with some written questions. I have three people who want to ask questions live, but we're having some issue to unmute them. So uh, uh, let's start with um, uh, Joseph. So I'm going to read out some of the questions in the Q&A, and then we'll try to unmute uh, four members, four uh, attendees wanted to ask live. So Joseph is asking us um, how important is knowing basic computer hardware, such as architecture, uh, computer architecture, basic software skills, such as assembler, how code is linked to each other, building software basics in terms of vulnerability of these items. So how important is all that? Um, this is a, a question It depends on your career path. And I will say for the vast, vast majority of cybersecurity roles, that is not terribly important. However, if you are getting into software bill of materials, you're getting into deep vulnerability analysis of code, and you, you need to understand how the BIOS boots up, what's the kernel, how is it invoked, what are the security vulnerabilities there, you get into that deep level of expertise, then of course, these are important. But the average person, is the entry-level job, a SOC 1 analyst, a security analyst helping with uh, vulnerability scanning, using Aqualis, Nessus Pro, whatever, OpenVos, those who are looking at open source web, you know, the OWASP on websites and stuff, this is not that important. But if you're going to get into an emerging field on software bill of materials and securing code, especially the open source code, this is quite important. Thank you. Um, I see the number of questions is building up, so we'll try to answer all of them quickly. Um, and we'll go back to Rashid later. We couldn't hear you, but uh, Christopher, do you are you able to talk? You should be unmuted. Christopher, let's see. No, I see Christopher is also muted. So uh, I mean, as soon as we can resolve that, that'll be great. And in the meanwhile, I'm going to, uh, oh, can there. You, can you hear me? Yeah. There we go. Hi there. Our first Hi. ever <laughs> live uh, question. Yeah, no. Since, yeah, I dropped. I dropped it in the uh, Q and A. Not in a good spot for. Uh, there's <laughs> a bunch of background noise that's going on around where. Oh, I'm you at, sound so. great. No problem. <laughs> um, where are you from, so I, I, or Chris? Uh, from North Carolina, actually. Um, oh. I was going to say, I'm a, um, a program director uh, for a, a cybersecurity program uh, at a four-year institution in North Carolina. So uh, when I saw Montreat College, I know it's right right up the road from where I'm at. And awesome. So, um, um, but um, no, I just wanted to uh, kind of briefly ask or touch on, um, it was mentioned in terms of mindset around hiring practices, uh, things changing around that, where it used to be you had to have kind of computer backgrounds uh, beforehand, but now you're looking at more uh, having graduates that have um, a number of different skill sets. And so what's unique about our uh, program is that our program is actually housed in the College of Business. And I wanted to kind of get your thoughts a little bit on having a fresh graduate who has both the business background, but at the same time has the technical skill sets. Yeah, Christopher, a great, great question in the sense that when they come from the business background and they understand the business's number one goal is to make money, they understand that risk is relevant, right? Einstein was right. It's all relevant. And in business, they typically come with, in, in my humble opinion, they come with a better mindset that there's physical risks, there's business risk, but the number one risk an entity has is not making money. So they're sometimes better at putting it into perspective of risk because cybersecurity is all about risk. 
It is essentially a professional risk management function. And management means you are actively taking steps, but it is an imperfect science. And so they, they can quite often deal with ambiguity a bit better. And then when we talk about the technical skills, I have to admit, you know, what technical skills? I, I'm going to paint the opposite side. And in our future podcast, we're going to challenge people to say, what do you know that proves you right? And what have you thought about that might prove that you're wrong? And the number of students that came to me with a master's in cybersecurity because they, I mean, they got an undergrad business degree and now they have a master's in cybersecurity and they wonder why they can't get a job because you, you know what is to be done, but you actually don't know how to do it. And people that can understand how businesses manage risk and how they view it from a business perspective, they then have the technical skills to start to go do something about it. But if you, when you refer to the non-technical skills, um, business part of your curriculum and your part of your just DNA is most likely, how do you affect the human dimensions of change? How do you get people to change their behaviors? And I think that is one of the huge missing links in most every cybersecurity program I looked at, the mental models. Um, so in, in business, you're typically teaching them the model of a marketer, the model of finance, the model of operations, and then they start to think that way, which helps them a lot. But it also, of course, depends on their career path. Yeah. Chris, hope that that answers your question. Um, I mean, can we, uh, we have a question from Andrew. Um, Andrew, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself and ask. Uh, Thanks, so. Sharon. Hi, Adam. Uh, hey, Andrew. Hey there. Where from? Uh, I'm an assistant professor up in uh, upstate New York at Empire State College. Cool. Awesome. And I, uh, you want to ask us? Yeah, I teach graduate level cybersecurity courses and I've developed several curriculums. Um, one of the things I wanted to address, Adam, is you mentioned a lot of skills. And I think there's a whole other side of cybersecurity that goes along with that skills. And that's that theoretical knowledge of teaching them how to solve a problem that doesn't exist. And I think that that begins with vocabulary. Um, when you teach your hands-on courses, how in-depth do you get with the vocabulary so that they are well-versed in the language so that they can present themselves at those interviews is really what my question yeah. is. Andrew, there's three or four things going on in my mind. It's interesting when you mentioned theoretical, but then when you ask the question, I'm like, that's actually like an essential life skill. Can you communicate with people? And it's funny, my current staff, my day job, I run a IT and cybersecurity for international missions organization that deals with arguably some of the most difficult cybersecurity challenges in the world. Um, every day, almost every day, I wake up to some tragedy that I wish I could unsee. I just got back from Lebanon and Syria last week. Um, or, yeah, last week, I'm losing track of time. But my staff is sick and tired of hearing me say the following, nouns matter. The definition of the term matters. And in cybersecurity, it's like, I actually don't like the term cybersecurity. I, I appreciate the way Evan Francine at FR Secure and Security Studio teaches it, which is around, it's really IT security, which is really synonymous with risk management. And these terms matter. What is a vulnerability? What is a threat? And then getting down to the theoretical level, I thought you were going to talk about like boson lepton interaction and relating the strong nuclear force to the gravitational term or something. But I think nouns absolutely matter. And then you hear the way different professionals use the term. And that's what I talk about being a part of the tribe. When you're talking with somebody casually and they're in cybersecurity, about five to 10 minutes, you can tell they're a poser. They suffer from the imposter syndrome, which I and so many other cybersecurity you know, leaders do. You can tell pretty quickly. i uh, curious on your choice of words on theoretical, but I think that's an absolute necessity in the skill is to be able to communicate with people and understand what they mean, not just what they said. Yeah, I chose theoretical uh, specifically because I believe there's a baseline amount of knowledge that individuals need because so many oh, people yeah. are coming from so many different directions into cybersecurity, like we just talked about with business versus technical skills. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a place for most people who can, I, I don't want to say walk the walk and talk the talk, but they need to become educated. And we- absolutely. We as educators view vocabulary as a sign of intelligence. Um, and I say that I hate to put us all in that we category, but most of the time when we're interviewing individuals or we're, we're doing capstone projects, we want students who are going to be able to be marketable 
And the only way that they're marketable is if they know what they're talking about. Um, so I really appreciate uh, this, this discussion because my research is around cybersecurity education and vocabulary. Um, and yeah. putting cybersecurity curriculum across disciplines. So putting it in the healthcare, putting it into mathematics and English and having them use uh, cybersecurity terminology to enhance the graduates of our school so that even the English majors become more cyber aware because they're probably gonna go out and interface with a tech writer and they're going to have to understand this vocabulary. So I just wanted to bring that up. I appreciate the time guys, thanks. Yeah. All right, thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much. And definitely pl please uh, join us also for the upcoming episodes. These are great topics that, that you brought up. Um, I currently don't have any other requests for live questions, but you're more than welcome to raise your hand. We still have some time. We can stick around a little bit longer if you'd like. And we've got quite a lot of written questions. We're going to start to uh, to address them. And then we have another question from Armando, which we will address. I saw you raise your hand. But I have a question from Mary uh, that says, a big challenge we have is how do we get students to the, quote unquote, to the level of experience employers expect? I think that's a great question, very much aligned with what you said earlier. Sometimes expectations are unrealistic. Frankly, we don't, uh, we just don't have enough people in the discipline let alone to that level of experience. So how do you get students to the, you know, the three years of, uh, I don't know, uh, understanding is a response, firewalls, Sims, Splunk, et cetera. How do you do that efficiently? I'm not saying you can do that in a minute, but how do you do that efficiently? So the, the three or four things to think about here is in most of human endeavor, there's only three reasons we really get fussed with each other unethical behavior, incompetence, or just mismanaged expectations. And mismanaged expectations is 95% of it. It's actually, I'm upset with you because I thought it was going to be done Tuesday and you said Wednesday. And this carries, in this area, when you say the employers expect, managing expectations with them is important because sometimes they expect a certain level of competence, skills, abilities, and knowledge. And, you, and really, sometimes the question is, how can I communicate to that employer that although our students doesn't have the number of years of experience, they have the experience solving those problems with those kind of tools and that kind of environment to be a part of your tribe. And this is where the competitions, the tri hack bees, the cyber bits, I mean, when you get into a live fire range and that student is able to describe that experience in that environment solving problems, you get a student with six, eight weeks of experience in a range, that's the equivalent of two or three years of experience in the real world of what they're really going to see. If they, I mean, assuming they didn't have access to this kind of a, a training environment, but that, that environment also then assesses the student. And just this morning, Harvard came out with their paper on cybersecurity, and they talked about the four main needs for hiring people in cybersecurity, four main needs for cybersecurity leaders. And then third one on the list was the ability to assess cybersecurity talent. And these platforms can assess the talent and show they have the experience solving the problem as opposed to my expectation is you have the number of years experience in industry. You can bridge the gap that way. And then where you say over here, there's enough people in the discipline with that level of experience. When, uh, when you're able to communicate to the employer, the employer or the potential employer, the competence the student has, the experience they have solving problems, how rapidly they come up to speed, they start to go, Oh, I, I actually might not have been asking for the experience in the job placement ad that I'm really seeking to come on board my organization. And therefore, just like almost everything else in cybersecurity, it's a human endeavor. That, yeah. that would be my thought, and I'm glad to follow up later. But I, I think what you said is basically by what you mentioned is that even doing like live fire attacks during the, the program, that can condense a, few, a couple of years of experience because... You can basically, if you look at a cybersecurity professional on the job, they haven't seen that many live attacks. Now, they're going to see one once in a while. But if you actually do those simulations during the course, you can kind of collapse, you know, running a ransomware attack, a supply chain attack, an AWS attack, and so on. And you can do that across one incident response course. And then you basically, you provide them with the experience that they might have taken them a couple of years yeah. to learn on the job, which is... By the way, a lot of the organizations, they're really teaching and learning on the job. So you actually can give them a head start. So maybe that that's 
That is great. And then they'll understand um, the importance of the basics because they'll get upset that somebody didn't patch a system or look for this vulnerability or yeah. you know isolate the network. So we've got uh, Armando. If you can unmute yourself, you're more than welcome to uh, to ask your question. I see that you're still muted. We'll give you a couple more sec uh, seconds. Armando, if you're with us. Uh, and if not, then uh, we'll, oh, there you are. I, I am. I was just I'm, I'm working from home and taking care of my granddaughter and all kinds of noise. Oh, okay. So I was trying to be respectful. Awesome. Uh, sure. but, but I do have a, a question. Uh, one of the things that we struggle with the most is getting our students to tell a conveying story. Uh, that interview story is very important uh, because that's how we that's how we're able to communicate with the employer. Uh, or with the with the interviewer uh, that we know what we're talking about, that what is our interest, what makes us special, what separates us from the rest of, of the field, uh, what 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 skills or what techniques are, are you using to teach the students to tell their story? Well, three three things, Armando, and you can say I say three all the time because that's as high as I can count anymore, but. The first one is there's a great video series on LinkedIn by Mrs. Glickman. You can look this up on LinkedIn. I think it's free for most everybody. And she does a beautiful job of answering this question. Tell me about yourself. Have them watch that. Have them practice it. And don't just listen to it and enjoy it. Practice it. The second thing is the, uh, the story brand ex exercise of how to tell a story, any story. So, the first story is about yourself, but you should lead that into and you set the stage to go to the second one and where let, let me, the student or the person being interviewed, tell you a story about something that I saw in cybersecurity. And then when you're able to tell that as a story, a protagonist, antagonist, overcoming the obstacles, reaching success of whatever that might be, and then the reflective learning associated with it, you start to achieve one of those objectives I mentioned earlier about being memorable. And the third thing that we just beat the crap out of the students are is you have to practice this. Being a good interviewer and authentic being interviewed is a skill. Learn how to answer that question. Tell me about yourself. Glickman does the best I've seen. Learn how to tell a story relevant to cybersecurity. The story brand technique is the best I've seen. And you finish it with something that's authentic and memorable about yourself. Because if you're not memorable, I don't care how well you did in the rest of the interview, you will likely not get the job. Hey, Adam, is this Jody Glickman? Because I just found it on YouTube yes. and, and uh, I'm yeah. sending you the link. Oh, great. The rest of the audience live. So I just found it while you were talking. So thanks very much for that. Great um, question, Armando. Um, yeah, and we have, uh, I think we have Andrew who wanted to ask a question. You, you should be able to. Yes. Hi there. Thank you. Hi. Uh, this question, I mean, you could spend probably a whole hour talking about this, so I don't mean to get you into a um, um, sidetrack here, but what types of writing skills do cybersecurity professionals need if a university or college has a cybersecurity major? What writing should they be taught? And you might put it another way, what documents will a cyber professional be writing on the job? It's actually a, a, an exceptional question in the sense that everybody says, oh, what a good question. No, this is an exceptional one. Why? Because it will be a subject of a future podcast. There are a few instructors that I've come by that have some of the best programs of technical writing specific to cybersecurity that I've seen. And, you know, one of my mottos is to shamelessly steal the best of what others have already mastered. So just go steal it. So we will, we will uncover that in a future podcast. But I will share with you this. When I... When I started to create my program, I asked people, cybersecurity hiring managers, what are you hiring for? Oh, yeah, I need somebody who's a SOC analyst who can triage and look at the headers and look at the LDAP records and stuff like, okay, great, awesome. And then I started to build a program for that. And then I thought, maybe I'm asking the wrong question. What do you fire them for? Why do they peter out in their careers? And, you, and then they say, oh, you know, they weren't a team player. They weren't critical thinking. And especially in the pen test arena, some of my mentors on my board said, that's the number one reason I let people go is they can't write a proper pen test report. They can't take a cogent, complicated, I'm sorry, they can't take a complicated subject, which is what we're dealing with, and write it down into a narrative that an actual mortal human being can understand that guides them to making a decision. And so that's the technical writing I strongly recommend. Take a complex subject, like a pharmaceutical sales rep. This is where we took our curriculum from. 
when I'm teaching them how to write, the pharmaceutical sales rep takes a very complex subject, the interaction to these drugs and all these chemicals. And then they try and get in the five minutes in front of a doctor who's a very smart person, but they're very busy. How can they distill all of that into something that changes the doctor's behavior to try this, to learn from it? And there's some of the best that's out there. And so writing is exceptionally important. And one of the first exercises I start in our program is writing about themselves, call it the Wall Street Journal article. But you have to be able to write a cogent report and memo to advance in your career. It's, it's a critical skill. Thank you. That's very helpful. And I look forward to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Thank you very much, Andrew. A um, couple more questions in writing, and I think we can do just in time. Uh, we'll answer them briefly. So a uh, question from Ryan Bradshaw. Hey, Adam, great to meet you. I'm Ryan Bradshaw from Johnson Community cool. College in Smithfield. Based on what you have discussed, I wonder if the private sector has a cyber incubator for new cybersecurity graduates to help them get real-world experience. Or are there many internship, apprenticeship opportunities that you're aware of? Also, we are hoping... Uh, to join the CCN next year. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> hey, Ryan, okay. there are a number of them out there. And in my selfish approach to trying to find the best that's out there, for example, I found the guy that leads this program, the internship apprenticeship, the, the new hire training and development program in American Express. But there is a number of them out there. There's a lots of lots of apprenticeship programs that are out there and lots of men- mentors that are out there. And the number of the companies, the yeah, something like 80% of all cybersecurity professionals are only hired into three industries, the government, the MSSPs, the security service providers, or the big companies, the Fortune 500. And so some of them have good entry uh, apprenticeship programs. I'd say actually a, a number of them do. And here in North Carolina, like the program we partnered with out of Atlanta called Road to Hire um, has a good one, but there's a number of others. And maybe we could Glad to take that offline to, to help you in your area and hope you've got my contact information. Reach out on LinkedIn or whatever. I'll yeah, try and connect you. definitely, definitely uh, follow up with us later. We'll, we can try to send you some information for sure. Um, I'll run through some other questions with you if you're still coming, which is great. Um, from Mysteria, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. How important is SQL, SQL knowledge for cybersecurity? Very I think for the vast majority of roles, it's not that important. There are areas, of course, where it is, you know, DBA security and be able to take large logs and putting them in a database and mining. But even, even today, you don't usually use those tools. So I think it's a, you know, SQL is a, as a structure program. Of course, it's a good uh, structure to know how it's done. But I think for a cybersecurity professional, it's not that important. All right. That's a short and concise answer um, from an... Anonymous uh, attendee, uh, what textbook and vendor neutral material do you recommend for proper cybersecurity for proper cybersecurity education? Where do I go to learn from a from a textbook? That's an interesting question. Can you learn cyber from a textbook? <laughs> oh, sure. I just it's, it's easy. I I just read. I just look at the pictures. But this this um maybe some this the, the person behind this question once reached out to me on LinkedIn or through this. Uh, later, but but it depends on what you're trying to learn. So to be honest, if you want the knowledge, what's the knowledge you want? I could, you know, but the books that I've come across that are awesome at the MITRE ATT&CK framework, those that are really better than the CompTIA work at SEC+, Plus, those that are better than, so it would depend on what you want them to learn uh, to the textbooks. I'm sorry, it's a little bit too broad for me to give a a cogent response. Yeah, if you have a, a more specific w- word you want to get into, or if you're completely new to cybersecurity, then maybe I'm sure Adam can recommend one or even send the link later on. But uh, uh, all right, from Carlos, any immediate skill sets that you have seen from military veterans that transfer over to cybersecurity? Actually, there's a lot of things in common, but uh, yeah. that, that a lot of skills that you that character and soft skills that I'm sure apply for cybersecurity. I've just interviewed a um, um, a fire, fire person, like a fire warrior uh, that was, mm-hmm. uh, uh, that, that uh, went to cybersecurity and he said it was very, very similar to, uh, uh, to, to cyber, to incident response, like first response. Yeah. yeah. So what do, yeah, what Carlos, do you see the military veterans? Yeah, Carlos, my thought there is not going to be one that a lot of people are going to want to hear. It depends on from what military you come from. When I interview ex-Israeli Defense Forces, they think an entirely different way in this, really dealing with ambiguity and structuring and solving problems and self-determined. And 
Then I interview somebody from like the Dutch military where I work a lot. And I go, I see a different level of international experience and maturity and because they're dealing with that context. Uh, by the way, the Netherlands has one of those letters D marquee where if you're Dutch, you can actually fire back in cybersecurity where it's still legal in the US. But I'll be honest with you, when I interview a lot of the veterans from the US military, there are several things that I see, one of which is they're used to a very structured environment. So if you want to go into an auditor assessor role, you can do quite well. On the other hand, some of those that I've interviewed from the military that are ex-Intel, three-letter agency side of you know, the Army Cyber, Cyber Command and the, the Cyber Command in Colorado Springs and stuff, they absolutely know how to think like the attacker. So I hate to say there's not a great unity that I see there, but when they come out the sad thing that I would say that is a lot of them don't have as much confidence in themselves as they have earned and should have. And part of our program is to help rebuild that way of thinking and loving on themselves and becoming the person that they they could and should become. So I know that's not what a lot of people wanted to hear, but I've seen three or four dramatically different people come out of the military as it would depend where. All right. Uh, I think we've answered uh, all the questions and amazingly uh, on time uh, we don't have any more uh, live questions so I just wanted to wrap up and uh, first of all I want to thank the audience uh, yeah. for joining this podcast uh, it's the first of a series we're going to keep running this I, I really really want to thank you uh, Adam I think it was great I, I learned a lot uh, personally you. myself uh, and I want to um, remind uh, the audience that this uh, podcast will be available shortly on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the Cyberbit YouTube channel, uh, and the Cyberbit LinkedIn profile. Just search for Cyberbit on LinkedIn or Cyberbit on YouTube, and it's going to be published there as well. If you follow us on LinkedIn, we will be promoting our upcoming podcasts uh, there and updating about them. And we will also be emailing you, of course, on the, on the upcoming ones. We're planning... Uh, another one uh, on the last week uh, of um, uh, of January. Uh, feel free to approach us, of course, Adam, you generously propose as well to propose uh, to approach you on your personal uh, LinkedIn profile and to follow you uh, as well and to reach out directly. Uh, we'd love to hear from you again on LinkedIn, direct messages or as a response to the email. We'll all get an email with the links to the to the podcast streamed, uh, which you can share with your with your community, with your colleagues, and also listen again. Uh, and if you have any ideas, you can just respond to the email that you will get from us um, with ideas for hosts that you would like us to invite, anyone yeah, you'd really like to hear. Uh, any topics you want us to focus on and dive deep? This was kind of a broad overview to the topic, and we already have some, obviously, a plan, but we'd love to to address whatever you're more interested in, problems you're trying to solve, and people that you'd like to hear, and we'll do whatever we can to help you. Um, so uh, please go ahead and reach out. I hope that was helpful for you, this first podcast. Uh, this first episode and uh, i'd like to wish all of you happy holidays we're going to hopefully see you after the holidays and uh, uh, see you next year and uh, thank you very much